Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to explain why prices determine costs and not vice versa. I will be talking through this uh, flow chart here. You can see preferences at the top. Um, I'll just leave it there, but don't uh, worry about this. I will explain it as the video continues. Now, if you can remember, in my last video, our old friend, the government employee, opened up his own coffee chain. In fact, he's rebranded to call himself GE, or G for short. And uh, here you can see the branded G Coffee. And in this video, uh, using uh, G as an example, I'm going to show you how the pricing of the coffee happens in practice and how it is that the costs are determined by the prices rather than vice versa. So let's start with preferences then. First of all, why do we start with preferences? Well, that is because in the real world, human action is the thing that determines almost everything that happens. Real people with real tastes and real decisions. So let's have a look at what this looks like in our coffee market. Here are all the the different uh, people, a, a, a sampling of the people in the society and their various different tastes. And um, you can see uh, within this uh, group of people, there are people uh, like Ray there, who doesn't like coffee for whatever reason. And there are people who really love coffee. And each one of them will, uh, you know, they'll value coffee differently as a product and they'll have uh, different price points at which they are willing to pay for coffee or not pay for coffee. Now obviously G has no real way of knowing this before he tests it on the market, but he does have a range of prices at which he is willing to sell. And on the real market there will be a range of prices uh, at which the customers will be willing to buy. And economists uh, use these things called supply schedules and demand schedules uh, in order to help um, work out exactly uh, what these prices may be. So uh, in this case, uh, this is just an example, I wouldn't get caught up on these yeah, precise figures too much, but uh, as you can see, the preference rank is on the left here. Uh, so let's just take base Liz as one example. She would buy one coffee for $2, but she wouldn't pay any more than uh, one dollar for her second co coffee for the third coffee she wouldn't pay any more than 67 cents and for the fourth coffee she wouldn't pay any more than 50 cents so if she was going to buy four coffee she wouldn't want to spend eight dollars she'd want to spend about uh, four dollars 17 something like that um so you can see here that, uh, you know, and obviously the first coffee is going to be worth more to her than the fourth coffee because she doesn't want four coffees. OK, so if we have a look at these uh, schedules, then the demand schedules and the supply schedule, uh, what do these mean? Well, let's have a look at the demand schedule first. That's the middle column. Uh, this means that there is one person who's willing to buy a, a coffee for two dollars. There are two people uh, who are willing to buy it for one dollar each cup there are three people who want it for 67 cents and there are four people who would be willing to buy it at 50 cents and then on the supply uh, side on the supply schedule you can see there are three uh, sellers who are willing to sell the coffee for two um, there are two who are willing to sell it for one uh, there's one who's willing to sell it for 67 cents and there are no sellers in the market uh, willing to uh, sell coffee for uh, 50 cents. So those four people who want the coffee at uh, 50 cents, they get, uh, they make no buys. Um, and uh, you can see that the, you know, one coffee here is going to be sold at two dollars. Two are going to be sold uh, for one dollar each, and one is going to be sold at uh, 67 cents. Now, let's uh, bring back our man, G. Now, what's he going to do? Now, he's uh, got these kind of historical figures. He's he's managed to obtain this information about the coffee market. So what does he do with this? How, what price should he be selling the coffee at, given this information? Uh, you can see, like, I mean, if it was him, he'd sell one at $2, he'd sell two at $1, and he'd sell one at uh, at 67 cents. Um, 
for the average. So maybe he says, well, okay, let me average those up and set an average price for my coffee at uh, $1.16 or $1.17 um, per cup. Uh, or he could uh, look at this and he could do deals. He could say, well, I will sell one coffee for $2 and I'll do a like a family deal for three coffees at $2.67. Uh, so what he decides to do, he says, he sets his price at $1.16. Okay, so so he's, um, he's in some ways below the market price. You can see that he's, uh, he's way below that $2 a cup price but he's above the uh, he's above the uh, the one dollar a cup price and uh, let's see how it goes well here are all the different customers uh, they're coming they're, and you can see uh, friended there he's willing to get one um, Bantu you know maybe he's got a client and he, 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 he grabs two Ray of course she's lactose intolerant she's not gonna buy one uh, black lesbian she comes in and buys them round for the whole cabinet because she's got important business to do as the prime minister. Um, based Liz, she's going to get one for her good buddy, the academic agent. And uh, so you can see that, you know, this pricing strategy is working for G. Now, why did the pricing strategy work? Well, uh, as I said, the individual units of coffee were below the perceived marginal value for a single cup, which was $2, but above the marginal value for multiple cups, uh, which was uh, working out at about uh, $1 each for two, if you remember. G was banking on people buying more than one cup, thinking that they were getting a bargain. And so, um, yeah, this was working for him. And on day one of trading, he made uh, some decent money. Let's pretend he made $200 in total revenue. Um, and now, looking to tomorrow, he wants to repeat this success. He wants to make $200 revenue again. And so, looking forward to that, he must calculate his costs. And of course, his costs are going to be made up of, uh, let's just keep this real simple, three different uh, components uh, variables here so he has employees he has milk and he has coffee beans this is uh, this is what he needs to uh, sell his products and so he must calculate something that we call the marginal revenue product that is the MRP and uh, then he must calculate the discounted marginal re revenue product which is the DMRP. RMP is the return that the entrepreneur expects to receive. This is the $200 that he's aiming to get um, for, uh, you know, for his sales tomorrow. The DMRP is the price that the entrepreneur will pay today in ex expectation for the MRP. Uh, and so these are, broadly speaking, the costs that he wants to pay now. The DMRP has to be less than the MRP for profit to occur. This uh, this is just basic common sense, of course. But how do we calculate the DMRP and how do we calculate the MRP? So let's just have a look at this. Uh, this is just an example, of course. Let's, so let's say um, A is employees, B is milk, and C is coffee. You can see that uh, four employees plus 10 milk plus two coffee, uh, that's going to get him $200 of uh, uh, return, his revenue. Um, and uh, you can see there that if he only has four employees, so if you reduce um, A to 4A to 3A, um, he's only going to end up with $180. So the marginal revenue product of A is $20. So that means that the fourth employee should be paid no more than 20. If he's going to pay any more than 20, he's going to make a loss. You know, it's not worth employing the fourth employee for more than 20. He has to set it for less than that uh, in order to make a profit. Uh, let's give another another example here. Um, so let's say um, we have a look with one employee. So let have a look at A. You've seen I, I've put one A um, with all the same ingredients there makes a hundred dollars. So a single employee gets a revenue of a hundred dollars. 
but of course no employees is going to get you a revenue of zero dollars so the mrp of the first employee is actually a hundred and so of course we want to pay him no more than one hundred uh, so the marginal um revenue product of the first employee is actually four times uh, bigger than the fourth employee so how does this work in practice well uh, so let's have a look at the four employees then uh, the first employee is ginger bill uh, we should pay him no more than $100 the second employee is uh, Don he should be paid no more than $50 because his MRP is 50 uh, Harry is a third employee uh, he should be paid no more than $30 and Mark is the fourth employee and his DMRP should be no more than $20. Let's just uh, look at this in practice. Um, so G here, he says, I'm going to pay you at these rates. He offers Bill $20 a day and Bill is like, yes, I will work for $20. Um, now Don, he has Bill as a basis of comparison and he's like, well, why is this dude working for 20? Uh, G has offered him 10 and uh, so he says, no, I want to work. I want to work for the same as Bill, $20. So let's see what happens. We have a bit of a dispute here between the worker and the employer. Um, G says 10 pay for you. Don says, look, I'm not going to work here for, for any less than 20. And G is faced with two options. He can either cave to Don, that's option two, have the twenty dollars, or he notes that Harry, he's willing to he's willing to work for ten dollars. Um, and so he fires Don and hires Harry. So let's pretend all of this haggling and stuff has already taken place and we settle on um, on these rates of pay. So Bill gets twenty, Don gets ten, Harry gets five. Mark gets uh, five, uh, you know, and obviously there's going to be uh, jockeying and negotiation and, um, you know, there's a bit of a knowledge deficit here between the uh, the workers and, uh, and G. They don't know exactly uh, what his uh, margins are. They don't know exactly how much they are worth. Uh, and so uh, let's just say that we uh, that we reach these um, uh, numbers. Then he has to price up the milk uh, and here are the supply and demand schedules in the current milk market. You can see here um, that uh, there's nobody in the market who's willing to pay uh, $2 a unit for milk. Uh, there are five who are willing to pay at uh, $1.50. There are 10 willing to pay at one and so on and so forth. So G here, well, he needs 10 milk to make his daily target for coffees. Um, so he spends, he buys up that first five for 50 cents each. Um, and then he spends, he buys the next five at the next rate up uh, for $1 each. So he, he buys five at 50 cents, five at $1. So his total spend is $7.50. But no tragedy there is a new challenger entered the market the gypsy has decided he's seen g making all his money on the on the coffee and he's decided he wants to get in on the coffee game and so here's gypsy coffee what's going to happen now well the gypsy unbeknownst to g who was just counting up his revenues for the last day and uh you know he missed his chance here the gypsy has sneaked in and he's bought that five milk at one dollars and he's bought the five milk at 50 cents so g is now forced to buy at these higher rates five milk at one dollar uh, fifty and there's still five left uh, for him at one dollar so g's net spend is now twelve dollars fifty on the 10 units of milk and uh, the gypsy is basically costing five dollars for sneaking in to the market. Now, you can see here that uh, the milk market after the gypsy has entered it may adjust. Um, maybe the milk suppliers decide that they want to produce more milk. Um, 
and uh, eff effectively what's happened is that the gypsy and G between them have bid down the price of milk. So let's just pretend that the milk market adjusts and the producers decide to um, you know, supply more milk in this way. Uh, if the gypsy tries the same trick tomorrow, and that is raiding uh, the five at 50 cents and the five at uh, 10 cents, now it will only cost G ten dollars for his ten milk as opposed to twelve dollars fifty at these adjusted uh, rates and again if this if this situation continued they'd continue to bid down um, the price of milk and if more uh, people entered the coffee market that would also affect the uh, the, the, the prices and the supply of uh, milk you can see this is very uh, dynamic uh, let's uh, price up the coffee then the, the coffee beans um, and you can see that this market here, uh, you can, uh, so, you know, there are four suppliers who are offering at 10. Nobody wants it for that price. It's too high. There are three who will offer it for $7.50. Uh, you know, the one person's willing to buy that price and so on and so forth. And, um, look, the gypsy has done the same thing to G in, in this. He, he snuck in, he's bought that first coffee at two dollars fifty and uh he's bought one at five so g again late to the market uh he you know he was caught out by the new by the newcomer his net spend for today is now twelve dollars fifty on the two coffee he's bought one at five dollars and he's bought one at seven dollar fifty so ahead of tomorrow's trading day g's costs are now uh, what well, he spent 40 on employees, he spent $12.50 on milk, he spent $12.50 on coffee, so his total costs are $65. And now notice his costs are ahead of tomorrow, so he's spent the money up front um, for what's going to happen. So let's, uh, and then we we start the whole cycle again. So here are all the people with their preferences. Uh, you know, they haven't really changed. You know, Ray still doesn't like coffee. Base list still really loves it, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we get the expenditures of the consumers. You know, uh, you know, similar things happen. Um, but let's have a look. At the end of day two. G has only made $120 in revenue, which is $80 below his target of $200. Remember, he wanted to make $200, but he only made $120. So his profits for today are $0.55, cents, um, which is uh, $120 less the $65 he spent, of course. And now the whole process starts again. And maybe G has to sit down and think, hey, why on day two did I make less than I made on day one? You know, maybe some of his new customers went to the gypsy. Uh, maybe he lost some people to that. Maybe customers are starting to get used to his pricing of, uh, you know, $1.16 a cup. And that's changed how, uh, you know, customers are doing their marginal valuations. There are all sorts of variables for why this has happened. He can't know for sure. But of course, he can try again. But you can see how his costing is actually coming after the after the pricing. It's all um, it you know the the causal relations run from the preferences to the prices and then to the costs. Uh, hopefully this uh, is clear. I realise that uh, some of this is a little bit complicated. If you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments. I'd uh, be willing to answer them. Uh, but hopefully you know a little bit more econ today than you did yesterday. Thank you very much. And a very special thanks to Sir Percy Blakeney, The Crimson Sater, Time Stealer, Nuri Nelson, Macadamia, Rosie Alpaca, Kuzga, Holy Spatula, Bruno Liette, Tragic Vision, Michael Burt, Ginger Bill, Blake Barrows, Charles Vincent and Edward Darrah.